season 30, episode 21. Coming up on the show, we've got the liquid robots of the Golden Wall smashing into the fourth plateau and gnomed by the Mini T-1000. I'm your host, Benjamin Grundy. Joining me is Aaron Wright. What's a Mini T-1000? Um, that's from Terminator, isn't yeah. it? Yeah. It's like a tiny little adorable psychopathic Terminator <laughs> that jumps on top of your car and tries to kill you. I'm not so sure that adorable and psychopathic don't try to kill you are things that really go together usually. <laughs> no, he's, he's obviously terrifying, like he is trying to murder you and your family. <laughs> but he's only a foot tall. Is it a psychedelic experience or is it an actual experience? No, like, this this comes from, remember Ron Quinn, we covered his story. I can't remember if we did it on the free show or in PLOS. but he, the little people. No, he spoke about when he was young, he and his brother, they went uh, treasure hunting in Arizona. His brother convinced him, once he got out of the army, to go looking for some lost Spanish treasure like in, in Arizona somewhere. So they went along, they spent over 12 months in this region. And remember, they came across this strange stone archway in the middle of nowhere. That's right. It was a portal of some kind. And one of the natives told them this story of uh, about 100 years ago, a bunch of Indians were just playing around, running through it. And two of them went through, and then the third one jumped through and never came out. So you're not going to tell me that they went back through it and a homicidal mini gnome came out of it? <laughs> no, well, Ron was the, the one who wrote this story and we discovered that Ron is the author of one of our favourite books on the show, which we covered a very Years long ago. time ago. It would be, you know, over yeah, a decade people. ago. This is Little People by Ron Quinn. And the reason he wrote this book is he had an experience when he was 10 years old in mm -hmm. upstate New York. And inspired by this, years later, he ended up writing an article that was featured in a, a newspaper in the region. He doesn't mention which one it was, but he ended up getting all this correspondence. He put his address and you know his, his contact information. And he ended up getting all these letters from people in the region, most prominently from the Catskills, who had personal encounters with elves and, and yeah. little people and dwarves. And what was intriguing is, yeah, you might think, okay, he got a bunch of fantasy stories, but a lot of the descriptions matched up. Because when you think of dwarves, gnomes, little people, you think of something tiny from a Disney movie. Yeah. But that's not what people were seeing. People were seeing w over one to two feet tall, hu very human looking beings, you know, perfect proportions. They're not midgets or dwarfs or anything. Perfectly proportioned human beings who are only up to two feet tall. And the description of their garb is all similar. Some kind of uh, green or brown, strange cloak. Leprechaunish. And often with long, gray, wispy hair mm. and huge eyes. Mm. All the eyewitnesses mention these huge eyes. Uh, so I'll be going into that because it's a bit of a classic. And how I got into it is a little bit funny as well because I, I came across a, another book which is really going to be the start of the Plus Extension coming up. It's called Aliens Are With Us by Bill Roundtree. What I learned from aliens visiting me over 100 times over 50 years. That's a lot of visitations. So you would think you would learn a lot. Is that a camera? Well, the, the camera is this interesting part of the whole story, which which I'll get into. And you would think, yeah, if you've been visited a hundred times over 50 years, you would have a lot to share. But I also needed a backup segment to that. <laughs> so it's one of those stories. And we'll get into why. Right. Okay. I'm looking what forward to it. What have you got? Okay. So it's uh, rather serendipitous that you had that uh, new weight screen coming. It was very psychedelic because oh, yeah, this one. Yes, that one. That kind of uh, Japanese chrysanthemum kind of uh, psychedelic effect. We should just leave this on for the whole stream. Then we won't have to worry about any camera issues. Actually, that's a fantastic idea. Let's just do that. <laughs> no, uh, I was coming across this great book. Uh, I didn't realize it's newly been published or recently been published on, on Kindle. It's a Psychonauts Guide to the Invisible Landscape, the Topography of the Psychedelic Experience. And I've actually had it, you know, hanging around in paperback I didn't realize for a long time in one of our boxes in somewhere. one of the boxes that I just can't be bothered opening uh, and I have looked at it but I've never dived really that deep into it because I must admit uh, the particular drug that he he talks about DXM uh, which is I want to get this right so it's uh, dextromethorphan right so got this, any on you right now no well if you've got cough syrup potentially <laughs> oh, okay <laughs> so what this is this is considered to be a, a lower form of uh, of drug amongst the, the psychonaut community or the neuronaut community is what he like refers a mild to. hallucinogen no it's not mild at all although also obviously it depends on dosage but this book was written by dan carpenter and i think it's the, the reason why it got my attention is because when you talk about a lot of experiences 
with hallucinogens, things like ayahuasca or uh, DMT, LSD, those sorts of drugs. Uh, even though many people experience an inwards kind of journey, you know, people have described things as seeing, um, you know, snakes entering their body or them, you know, delving into, uh, you know, deep memories and solving traumas and that kind of stuff. A lot of the people describe experiences where they actually go to a space, like it's a real, it appears to be a real space, you know, real than real is that old term which is used. Um, and obviously they encounter things like strange little elf-like entities that come up a lot. The machine elves is something that people like Rick Strassman, um, you know, and others have described. So, but a lot of the time it really is going somewhere else. Whereas with DXM, this particular book focuses really on going into your mind like literally into a space in your mind. It's the guide to the invisible landscape. So it's it's almost like a, a travel guide. Yeah. The topography of the psychedelic yeah. experience, like mapping it out. Look, I think, and, and sometimes when we talk about these experiences, don't, I think, look, we, we get criticized for talking about, you know, or glamorizing these sorts of drugs, these hallucinogenic drugs. Uh, I do not recommend that you take these experiences or these drugs to have these experiences. Uh, I certainly, uh, I'm not saying that you know, there's, there's nothing in this, there may be something in it. And we know even recently in the last 10 years or so that they've been looking at it from a, you know, a therapeutic kind of perspective, that we can use these drugs to, you know, in a therapeutic setting to help people get through traumas. So there may be some application for it. This you're doing it not. again though, you're doing it, this is what you did in the last episode on Plus. You gave all your opinions on the stuff no, oh, you before, you, before you spoke about the stuff. No, you wait for me to give my opinions on this because this book, all I will say, keep this in mind, this book is a demonstration as to why you should never touch DXM. Stay the hell away okay. from it, <laughs> avoid it. It's really bad, it has devastating consequences. But let's, get, let's jump into it, right? So Dan Carpenter describes that you know, the, the whole idea of uh, exploring your consciousness, you know, using these substances, your consciousness wasn't even recognized as a credible scientific subject until at least the 1990s. Like it's been on the periphery and it's been around there, but this real deep dive into what is consciousness, what is the seat of consciousness, wasn't readily accepted in, you know, into the scientific community until that recently. And he says, look, you know, I've had this uncle who was a physicist and, you know, where we see that the world started crossing over into, you know, quantum physics. And we started to realize that consciousness may be affecting our physical reality, obviously at the quantum level. But he had this, he thought he's going to catch his uncle out because his uncle's this physicist with a leading university. And he thinks, oh, I'm going to ask him about, you know, why is light, you know, travels as a particle or a yeah, wave? Okay. You know, I'm going to, I'm going to get him that. I'm going to say, is it, you know, conscious? It's to catch him out. Yeah, I mean, obviously I'm paraphrasing exactly what I said, what, what he said. It's like the observer is changing the well, quantum that's what he's state. Trying to say. Yeah, he was hoping, he was hoping that his uncle's response would be something like, oh, it's like it's another dimension, you know, sometimes leaking into our reality. And this is why sometimes it's this and that. Why is physics so lame? Oh, it's always lame. But anyway, <laughs> he goes and asks him, right? And his uncle's response was just like, uh, I don't know. I'm, it's just I, all I do is observe, and that's the realm of physics. And so, until I know exactly what's happening scientifically, I have no idea. God, that's a boring. Oh, he, exactly. Like he was like, and he was let down. Like you know, Dan was clearly let down. He's like, well, you know, I'm not going to get the answer here. So we went and got 20 bottles of cough syrup, and was like, oh, blah, blah, this, <laughs> this is the thing, right? So amongst the the, the psychonaut community, it's called robo tripping, right? Because DXM is in robotussin. The cough suppressant. And so what, and it's normally kind of suggested that it's just a bunch of teenagers that go and buy it and they drink a whole heap of it and they have, you know, they see kind of colors and, you know, have a slightly different experiences. I think, in fact, um, South Park did an episode on it. Oh, really? Like years and years and years ago. And they, they tried to take it because they thought that if they take this cough syrup and have these experiences, they'll get all these ideas. And so they wrote them all down. And, that these, <laughs> and when they came out of it, they were like, Oh, and that's exactly what happened right. with this drug. It's also known as robo tripping because apparently the the substance itself and the other things that are in cough syrup, and this is why, again, don't ever take this. Don't go and drink a whole bunch of cough syrup because it might have paracetamol in it. It might have other drugs in it that can kill your liver. You know, cause a whole heap of other problems. That's why it's really dangerous. Uh, but that's where you get these plateaus, right? So what it is for most people, if you just go and take a little bit extra cough syrup. Is in really low doses, it has no effect whatsoever. But if you, you know, take a little bit extra, you know, drink half a bottle, something like that, you might hit the first plane and the, or the first plateau. How many plateaus is there? There's four. Okay. There's four plateaus. So the first plateau was just this simple kind of, um, you, you might feel a little bit giddy, you might see colors around things, uh, you might have, you know, that kind of that halo effect in your hands when you look, all that kind of thing, very low level stuff. 
then you progressively move up. But you have to take larger and larger quantities of this stuff to get to those levels. Uh, the other thing is it fits into a class of drugs that's uh, a, a dissociative. It's kind of like ketamine, like it sits in that, that kind of realm of drugs. And so what happens is, is that ketamine uh, is a rather sh a relatively short acting drug in comparison. DXM, because of the way it's absorbed by the stomach and is you know, processed, it takes much longer for the effects to, to wear off. So you can go into these experiences for a very long time. So the more you take as well, the longer you're in these realms. Really? And we know from stories about DMT, DMT being a very sh relatively short acting experience. Like if people smoke DMT, for example, uh, normally they are only in the space for about 20 minutes, but they commonly encounter entities. Elves, witches, you know, strange sorts of creatures. Um, they're guided into spaces. I was looking at some of those reports. Reptilians. Today. Reptilians. Uh, remember the spider screwer? Remember how there was that person oh, yeah. claimed that they they <laughs> yeah, went basically into this realm, and when they went into the realm, this spy, this neon glowing spider came along and started sticking like a proboscis into them. It was a spider them. woman. It was a spider woman. That's right. And then screwed two them. Very was, large proboscises. Yes, and they loved it though. I'm like, no, this is not good. These these are not what? good spaces. No, come on, getting screwed by a large interdimensional spider. She had two entity. massive boltons. So <laughs> if you just if you didn't look at the legs. You can kind of I get away with it. How you try to rationalize? You're like, at what point am I aroused compared to Look, where do I throw up? It's like, you're in the DMT realm. You know you're going to be trapped there for, what is it, seven minutes? It's like, the no one's well, around to see it. When in Rome? <laughs> <laughs> it's like, well, no, because you don't know what they're taking from you. There's other experiences which are, I mean, uh, to me... We do, it's called semen. For me, <laughs> well, that's what they're taking. <laughs> One guy was sprayed with this interdimensional, uh, like, clown entity ecto semen. <laughs> I'm not kidding you. This is DMT. So this is not a good thing. Yet. And he Again, claimed, you're giving the punchline to the story without well, no, any like build he was, he was, Well, that's the whole this, story. That was a whole... Very short. It was like, what are your experiences on DMT? He's like, I end up in this realm. This thing sprayed me from what appeared to be a penis. <laughs> and covered, coated my entire body. When you say thing, you mean some interdimensional like, clown. Interdimensional clown entity. The right. dark clown kind of entity. Was it just rainbow coming and, and, out of it? Well, that wasn't stated. This thing kind of, you know, flooded all over him. And what's weird, though, it, it backs up other stories that I was going into. So he claims that when this stuff came over him <laughs> he was like oh it was so incredible at first until he realized how disgusting it was but he said that when he woke up it was still all over him right. it was invisible oh and he's like trying he's like ah, ah, ah. And he said it was felt it dripping off his oh, arms dude. until he jumped up and then once he kind of jumped up it was like it all just disappeared right. like the the kind of experience just rapidly this shirt all stiff well other people have described similar sorts of experiences where they've come out of the trip and this is the weird stuff about this is that with, with DMT um, it all should be you know occurring in your mind like if we're talking about it from you know a neurological kind of standpoint this is just a drug you're taking you're not really going anywhere else it's all being generated by your mind but why is it that people come out so there's this great example I was reading it's one of the very few that I've ever come across um, of where this woman goes into and smokes DMT and she'd smoked it using a pipe. So there's a possibility that maybe she had dropped her lighter or something. Yeah. But that apparently is, is ruled out because the lighter was kind of like thrown to the side and immediately went out and she knew what she was still doing. You still have your faculties to a point. But she claims that she closed her eyes as soon as she took this toke. And as soon as she took it in, she was blasted off into this other space. And when she was in this space, it was like it got the attention of this, this ball that was just hanging around. It was completely this desolate isolated lonely place and there's this ball just bobbing sentient DMC Sent ball well, that's exactly what she said she said there was this feeling about it that it was intelligent and it was curious but it was also malevolent it was it was pissed off it hates you well it just comes over to it right as it comes closer and closer all of a sudden it kind of like comes close and then it expands out and there's just flames like plasma flames the way she described it it comes right up to her and then slams into it and then bounces off and is gone. She comes out of the experience, and when she comes out of the experience and looks down, her shirt's burnt. Oh, wow. Like down, I mean, isn't that incredible? Oh, that's cool. So for people to go, look, it's just happening inside your mind, mm. yeah, I mean, that's probably happening in a lot of experiences, but an actual physical response, I'm like, is the nocebo effect so strong that she somehow generated a massive amount of heat out of that part of her that's, body? That's like those sci-fi shows where you go into some virtual world and if you die in the virtual world, you die in the real world. Yeah, yeah, it kind of is like that. The Matrix um, or something. Yeah, I mean, and then there's other experiences of where uh, one woman described that 
uh, she had taken the substance. I think this was an intramuscular injection or something, uh, but the substance started to kick in. And as it did, she found that there was this suddenly, the room was still the room. She could see the room, but there was this sheet of like film in front of her. And it was this sticky white kind of weird, but semi-translucent film. It's like tape, but like all just one big piece. And then she's able to stick a finger through it. And she actually kind of like pulled through and started to go through it. These like weird, like, um, what was it? Crystalline mosquitoes. Just what I like. Oh, yeah. And they started attacking her. And they were trying to get into her and attacking her. She's like fighting them off. And then the whole thing collapsed. Like this weird kind of thing all fell down. And they're just on top of her. Yeah. And she's screaming, rolling about. It's like, do you want to get jizzed on by a DMT clown or oh, fight off the giant mosquitoes? I know. Like, which one do you it's want? It's like, yeah, this is not good. And I get, like, I, I get the appeal. And this is why I think DXM is a little bit different. And it has this appeal that if you're only, you know, going to the first or second plateau, you get all those kind of fun effects without any of this weirdness, right? But then when you cross up to the fourth plateau, that I, I called it crashing into the fourth plateau because that's really what happens. You smash into it at this incredible speed and it just, it takes your brain to places that you could never possibly imagine. Well, it's interesting describing that giant fiery plasma ball yeah. that burnt that woman. It, it reminds us of what people claim they've encountered as guardians of the threshold that seem to be stopping people from going into the next layer, the next dimension, whatever is beyond. You know, we've had those stories of what's the, the is it not Zozo, but the one with multiple eyes and multiple Yeah, I arms. can't remember the name of it, but yeah, it's like, it's almost like a, like a, a, a Vishnu kind of entity or a, a Vedic kind of entity that's there. Yeah, and this is actually something similar that comes up with DXM. Um, so DXM, as Dan points out, it is it is slightly different, and this entire book really is an exploration initially of within his own mind. Like the on the government DXM website right now, oh, D great. DEA .gov. Mm -hmm. I won't give the full like, URL, but it's the first thing that comes up when you search for DXM. It it sends you to the DEA website. Yeah, and robo tripping and the dangers, and really it is. It's it's not just the dangers encountered as guardians of the threshold that seem to be stopping people from going into the next layer, the next dimension, whatever is beyond. You know, we've had those stories of what's the, the is it not Zozo, but the one with multiple eyes and multiple Yeah, I arms. can't remember the name of it, but yeah, it's like, it's almost like a, like a, a, a Vishnu kind of entity or a, a Vedic kind of entity that's there. Yeah, and this is actually something similar that comes up with DXM. Um, so DXM, as Dan points out, it is it is slightly different, and this entire book really is an exploration initially of within his own mind. Like the on the government DXM website right now, oh, DEA.gov. Mm -hmm. I won't give the full like, URL, but it's the first thing that comes up when you search for DXM. It it sends you to the DEA website. Yeah, and robo tripping and the dangers, and really it is. It's it's not just the dangers of this particular drug. It's also uh, all the other drugs that are inside. You know, uh, cough syrups that actually can cause problems. But um, he says, look, you know, when I was younger, when I was 18 years old, I took my first hit of LSD, and I remember returning home after the the peak of the trip and having this deep realization that my entire experience growing up was founded on absolutely nothing. It's like from taking the, D, the um, LSD, he experiences this kind of existential crisis. And it, it's funny how people seemingly end up being set on this path to go through these journeys because right after this happens, it just happens to be um, going through a thrift, you know, a, a bin at a thrift store and he finds Robert Munro's journeys out of the body, like the incredible works of Robert Munro describing how people leave their bodies. And he says it was odd that I came across this when I did because I was right in the middle of sub suddenly having tremendous luck with lucid dreams at the time. So he's like having these lucid dreams and he finds this book which just further propels it, which plays a role later on when he starts taking uh, DXM. But he points out early on in this book that you know, I've had some very dangerous and scary situations when I've been dealing with this drug inside my mind or inside this space. Um, but he says the key to this is learning how to navigate. Once you learn how to navigate, uh, and your ego is kind of removed, you're able to have these incredible experiences. And I was about to say fulfilling experiences, but mm. they're not, f well, not that kind of fulfilling, but they're, they're not, like they're, uh, he, he was- They're dangerous, they're dangerous Very, very dangerous. Like you said, you don't know what's happening to you, you don't, want, you don't know what's being taken from you, you don't know what these entities can do to you. And even if it's not your body in another dimension, it's every other part of you. 
Exactly. It's yeah. the more important it's, parts of you. Well, potentially, it's like your soul. Yeah. Like, it's described as being like, he talks about your ego, and then when your ego kind of dissolves, you have the anti-ego. And, and that's one thing I will say about this book, where it kind of is, it becomes a little bit confusing when he's trying to express, you know, it's like this ego, anti-ego thing, and, you know, where he is, and where the self is, and the I is, and that kind of thing. But he points out, he's like, if you have these experiences, it's extremely difficult to translate them into yeah, language. Of course, yeah. And I get that. Like, that that makes sense to me. That you, if you're experiencing something in your mind, yeah, how do you explain this? But he says, look, when trying to, to move through uh, these plateaus, um, in this particular book, he focuses on, you know, 10 main encounters and then he has three follow-up encounters. Mm-hmm. Uh, but it all kind of comes in together. And it's just a, it's a really great example, though, of just like, it's never easy with this stuff. Because he's like, oh, well, before each trip, I'll take a B-complex multivitamin, a Xanax and a Valium, uh, maybe a couple of benzos just to get me into the right space to prevent brain damage. Uh, I was also using it as a crutch, but, you know, that's fine. Uh, and then, of course, I'll take another benzo the following day just to ease myself back into the world. If you're having to take all these mind-altering substances just to have fulfillment, it's probably not a good idea to be experimenting. He just sounds like a drug addict. He That's does, what they describe, yeah. you know. Yeah, he does. Take well, a little bit of this, and then I'll have a hit of that to kind of soften the edge, and then this will bring me back up, and then I'll take this. Yeah. You just sound like a drug addict. There was another book I was reading today, actually, and um, it was also described, he describes it as well, is that the actual psychedelic state can become an addiction in itself. Like, the traveling into these realms without any type of physical addiction. Yeah, of course. Uh, it does become an addiction. And I think that's to do with the entities that people encounter. I think these entities, you know, want you there. There was a great example of going back to, to DMT where a guy took uh, DMT and uh, he smoked a crystal of it. And when he comes to, he finds himself um, lying on a table. And as he's lying on a table, the room's full of greys. And all the greys are extremely excited, like grey aliens. And they're all excited and they come running over and they stick instruments and monitors and probes into every orifice of his body. And they're like, you gotta go, you gotta go, quick, 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 quick. And he's like, what the hell? It's like trying to understand what's occurring. When all of a sudden, he suddenly flung off into another realm. It's like this portal opens and he goes flying off into the other realm. It's like this, these greys were waiting for someone to take this substance and they were using him as like a, a guinea pig to monitor him as he enters into the realm. It's like they had waited mm. in this space and they were really excited. And he went into this realm and they collected all this data and they, when he came back and when he started coming out of it, they got really angry because they couldn't monitor what was going on right. anymore. And it's like, yeah, this might be occurring inside your brain. But even so, how is that a good thing? Like, it doesn't seem like it's a, a comforting, joyous kind of experience. It seems like it's a very dark kind of but experience. But this Dan Carpenter guy, he found something different. He found the way to make it to... The, the what are the the fifth plateau the fourth plateau the fourth plateau he said i felt ready to go ahead into the so-called fourth plateau and users report that there are four levels or plateaus depending on the dose and with each effort or each uh, attempt to reach the fourth plateau more effort is required but this book really was and I, and I do like it in the sense that he's trying to approach it from this journalistic kind of point of view and he's like i just want to observe it and it's, it's ironic that it's a you know like an, a dissociative kind of drug he wants to completely dissociate and just report on what he explores and what he sees and so he's like well i've accomplished at least 10 times where i've taken over at least over a thousand milligrams of substance which is a huge dose by the way uh and i've had these incredible trips and he says, what neuroscience has missed, and this is the single most important line of reasoning, is that uh, the brain is not the mind. It's not. And this is what came to him as he was going through. So let me describe some of the early experiences. This happened uh, back in 1996, 1997. This is the period we're describing it. And he says his first high dose of DXM took him by completely surprise. And he says, because all of a sudden I realized that it wasn't just me. I wasn't an I. It was an us. And it was a we. I suddenly became very uncomfortable because he said when he was uh, inside, he actually found himself inside literally his brain, like physically inside his brain. And there were all these other entities around, but he kind of couldn't make them out. But these other entities were other hymns. There was like other things. And he said, I mean, they were like other hymns. He was no longer I, he was we. There were other ones of him that were around. Like some kind of multiple universe. Yeah, like this weird split personality. Those are the versions of him are also on DXM well, at that particular moment and they're all meeting up. This You're very astute there because he ultimately ends up calling this space the Hive, like where he travels later on, he calls it the Hive. And while he doesn't... Do they fight to the death? No, they don't do that. No, I wish that would make it 
much better. While he doesn't describe that, um, I think that's in a way possibly what's occurring here. That he's like he's hit some type of, and he kind of does touch on, I suppose, but not directly saying it. It's some type of multi-dimensional nexus in a way. But also, even though it's he says us, there's other entities that aren't him either but they're all hanging out in his brain like they're all up in this space but at first because it's the very first time he's taken this high dose he's completely unwilling to move he said oh, it's like i'm pinned to this wall it's like i'm right up against the wall and i can't move but my second trip was this <laughs> he puts an extra 200 milligrams in it's like oh well <laughs> that wasn't enough I'll so go just, a higher just, dose. just for reference i looked it up while you were describing this there's uh, on average 15 to 30 milligrams in an entire bottle of cough syrup right and he's taking a thousand on his first trip and now he's onto 12 or 000. maybe it's 15 milligrams per dose it must be per, per dose. dose right yeah. yeah um but this is pure so he's not taking he's not taking it for cough syrup he's gotten mm-hmm. tablets a hold of the substance somehow um, but on his second trip he says he finds himself uh, seeing this colored plastic mindscape and he's becoming very privy to the inner workings of his brain he says it's a insider's view like the astral realms it's not an astral realm it's not an interdimensional space it's hopelessly inside his head and he says i'm convinced that the machine-like workings that i was witnessing inside my brain was what was controlling me and my my life really now he says that when he comes into this space and he's finally able to kind of pull himself away from the wall and start moving around he says there's these thick taffy like clouds that are everywhere like it's all like this fluffy substance everywhere but he says it's almost like he calls it mind taffy but he says that's also think lights and he says it's like these strands you realize it's these strands like these long long strands of fiber optic cable they're all kind of bunched together fiber optic cable yeah. and he's just like w- wading through it and it's all around him and he's like oh this is really strange and as he's moving through these taffy clouds he says he encounters the golden wall and it's something that I've read about in other trips he rides, but it's not something I've ever experienced myself. It's this huge shimmering wall of yellow light. And he suddenly moves in onto this wall and he says that he can see up like really close. It suddenly, you know, becomes a microscope. And he can see that the wall is smooth, but it's got this uniformed uh, pitted kind of pattern across it that doesn't change, right? And he says it's really odd. Like he doesn't understand exactly what it is, but he leans and obviously it becomes apparent later on, which I'll describe. How tall is this wall? Can he get over it? It's huge. Like it's just, it's It's impenetrable. impenetrable It's an impenetrable gold wall with these, these weird uniform pits in it. Mm. And he says that, um, I, I decide to try to lean up against it and rest. And as soon as he decides to lean up against it and rest, he finds himself back in his bed. He's like, Oh, I'm like, I'm back. Like it just suddenly ends and he's, and he's back in his bed. He's like, at this point, I hadn't developed any solid ideas as to what the wall might be, but I was intrigued by the caverns of this taffy substance and the lights that are moving around. He says there are also aware, intelligent, molecule-like things. They're perfectly defined, moving in orbits and performing maneuvers and tasks. They're moving through these taffy-like clouds. What, like little balls of configurations floating around? He says it's almost like electrons. It's like these electrons that are spinning around and he says he can see them. He sees them every trip and they're doing something. They're performing tasks in these tight choreographed maneuvers. And he says they're following their duties in this very animated but no nonsense way. They're brightly colored. Sometimes they're striped blue and black or yellow and red. Some are circular shaped, some are barrel shaped, but they've got tendrils coming off them of green plasma. And they move through like uh, schools of fish, like glowing neon orb schools of fish just plucking at things and pressing things and performing these what he believes is some type of duty so they're not floating around aimlessly they've actually got purpose absolutely got a purpose right and in light of what he describes with the taffy later on you start to go oh maybe they're you know maybe they're neurons or something or maybe like that's how is he actually in his own brain he's in his well (laughs) that's what he believes he's in his own brain and this golden wall is that to keep him in or to keep something out uh no, it's he does have other like uh, barriers until he takes higher substances that prevent him from moving, you know, into the other realms, right? Okay. But because I think like not that it's directly said, but we're still on the second or third plateau here. It's like he leaves his mind at one point. He leaves, his, and that's where he ends up on the fourth plateau, which is the the really crazy space. Um, but I think at the moment this wall is not what you expect it to be. Although for some of you, you know, listening or watching, you might actually already know what this wall is. But regardless, going, you know, through this this taffy and seeing this wall and, you know, this is like his second or third experience and he's watching these green plasma tendrils, 
He says, I realize that I'm interacting with an invisible person. There's, there's someone there and he's speaking with me and he's merrily explaining about these green electric tornado-like vortices that are whirling in the distance. And it says to him, if you enter one of those, your ego will be put back together, but you have to get off here now. Wait, who's telling him this? It's like <laughs> him, but he doesn't, he says it's just an invisible entity. But I get the impression that it's another version of him inside his brain. It's like, because he's, the, he talks the about Damon the ego and the anti-ego. It's like this kind of, these spaces, the we. Um, but he says, deep within the taffy chambers, my companion had returned. And he shows me this flesh-coloured, churning-coloured wheel. Sorry, flesh-coloured wheel, but it's also got lights on it. Right, okay. It's, and it's, he says it's, it's like, like... a giant flesh-coloured wheel of fortune? Yeah, it's like that. But he says it's like it's got, like, fleshy pimples all over it. And it's going <laughs> crazy. Gross. It's, it's gross and it's going crazy. A little bit of hair and coming he off says the, it's the like, cubes on the side. No, there's nothing like, there's nothing hair, but it's like, it's, going, it's like spinning off its axis and it's clearly chaotic. There's clearly problems with it. And he says it's talking like it's, its voices are coming out of it. All these voices coming. It's like, one point it's Porky Pig. The next second it's Alan Alder. <laughs> And he's like, I don't know what the hell's going on. You know, it's all these weird voices. And he's like, I don't understand. Ronald Reagan starts talking. <laughs> and he's like, I'm just, I'm frightened. Like, I'm really frightened at this point. And he realizes that, like, it clicks. Like, it just suddenly snaps with him. And he's like, I know what this is. This is the regulator of my emotions, right? This is what serves up his emotions. And you know that it's whole... It's all out of whack. Because he's not controlling it. Right. Because he's left, because he's taken this substance. He's no longer in control. So he said this thing, it's gotten loose. It's now on its own. It's crying. It's laughing. It's goofy. It's serious, but it's driverless. And he said, for me, this was only the beginning of immensely unsettling discoveries, of which he's about to encounter. So uh, he takes more trips. And ultimately, he uh, interacts with these ego vortices, those spirals of light. And he says it very much does look like a, uh, a tornado on its side, but with this green glowing kind of light to it. And he says, I pass into it and he goes into some kind of area. And it's really fascinating because as I was you know, pointing out earlier there, he said the key to all of this is learning how to navigate. I haven't included it in my notes here. But with his navigation, and this becomes important as you seem to cross from this third to fourth plateau kind of area, is that what you have to do is you will look around your space. And when you look around your space, you'll see these tiny little specks of light, like little tiny specks of light, but they're silvery. If you focus in on that, all of a sudden, it will form like a crevice, and then you can go and climb through that crevice. And when you climb through that crevice, you go into a next the next space or the next realm, which might be another part of his brain or his, you know, whatever's inside there. But he says, when he passes through one of these vortices, um, there's this entity inside it. And he says, he's not sure it's an entity at first, but it, he says this thing standing before him has the appearance of converging lines in a face, like a splayed out crab or radiating cables. It's got this what? like inlaid design. He says, it's alive, but it's made of liquid metal. It's this kind of organic metallic blend. that's like congealing and moving before him. And he says, I finally made contact with this thing. And as soon as he does, he's like, this like thing comes out of it, ejects straight into it. <laughs> what do you mean a thing like, this comes thing out of it? Comes out of this long silver thing, like just comes and ejects into him. And he says, it probed me very nonchalantly. <laughs> I ended up standing there frozen, <laughs> resting pinned somewhere, not knowing what I was doing. And he realized he was up against the golden wall. He had nowhere to go. Pinned so him up against the golden wall and probosed and- him. him. <laughs> And he just let it go. He's like, well, you know, I was here, so I had nowhere to go. So I just went, oh, okay, I'll go with it. He said, I called them liquid robots because more for the apparent indifference to my feelings they uh, exuded than anything metallic about them. But Did they he were pick alive. up on the purpose of this procedure? Not yet, right? He said they were alive, they were organic, but they were somehow technology as well. I later renamed them the crab-faced others, right? Now he says, this, this is a state where it's almost like he kind of implies that this thing is performing the duty of destroying his ego. Right. It's like that that ego death that we hear of. Um, but it wasn't quite. But then he's like, and he doesn't describe, and this is what's a little bit frustrating about the book, is that he has these little like um, instances of where, the way that he's done all this is he's kept a journal next to his bed or a notepad, and every time he's come out of the experience, he's immediately written everything down, and he includes some of those retyped notes in there. But then it's like, He's like, oh, you know, I've only ever found mention of a, of a furniture by one other person, but all of a sudden there's this chair there. I'm like, <laughs> like what, you're getting furniture? And he says, I was plunging into the taffy-like clouds and I came to hover over a crevasse. 
and I, it felt reminiscent of honeycomb, but not structurally. I couldn't make out what it was, but there were appliances and couches that were made out of the living hive mind itself. And I'm like, oh, okay. So we've gone from you having this weird entity couches. probing you to you coming into a space where literally there are couches and appliances, he says. So there's like some weird Ikea store in his head. Pretty much. Yeah. But we're just assuming he's in his head. We, we don't know what's going well, on at, the, at all. Well, no, he it, could be in any he, he, countless absolutely. dimension. He could be anywhere, right? But at the moment, it feels like it's in his head. Um, <coughs> but when he later on describes, you know, going to these other places, then I'm like, no, he's going somewhere else. Like he's going into some um, interdimensional, you know, nexus or something like that where these other entities exist. But it always seems like it's all about him, though. And maybe that's just because all of this is just... You know, an absurd hallucination that's being produced by his mind and anyway, obviously we can't rule that out um, or because it is consistent with so many of the other reports he is actually going somewhere like he's entering into a space that is you know not known to us but you know deeply important to our consciousness but for what purpose no one really knows um, but he has this woman who is a registered nurse who's actually in the house and uh, she also just happens to be a practitioner of the occult but psychedelics are not her thing so her name is Beth, and she agrees to look after him while he's taking these substances. And in one of the very first instances, uh, he's like, I went too far. And he tried to kind of come out of it, and he started feeling really unsettled. He felt like there was something very wrong here. And he says, my internal clock went offline. And he basically got trapped in there that every time he came out of the experience, it would immediately revert, and he would be back in a new realm. What? And it kept on going over. And each time he came out, he's like, I'm Dan Carpenter. I'm... Um, Carpenter, that's right. And he kept on doing it. And so he, he goes and kind of drags himself down, like he pulls himself down the hallway and screams out to Beth, you know, I need help. And he's kind of in between two worlds. And he's been taken on a guided tour of his mind and other parts of himself and shaking hands with himself and these other entities at the same time <laughs> coming out of it and realizing that Beth is trying to pour a bath for him so that he can climb into this bath. Oh, my gosh. Himself out. So it was so, so like some kind of um, hallucinogenic uh, groundhog, groundhog day. Yeah, it really is. Yeah, yeah, that's exactly what it is. Uh, but apparently it's quite common for people to take high doses of DXM, which he wasn't aware of. Um, and he says he eventually learns how to control this. But at the time, he said, I felt like I was only one third of myself. I was stripped down to a ghost of myself. Uh, at the same time, while he was like viewing his neurons and these weird voices were coming out of him and that's where Alan Alda comes back and this other voice starts talking to him and George Carlin comes through and SpongeBob SquarePants happens. Okay. Like, it's completely madness, right? It's complete and utter madness. But he says while this is all going on and he's fraternizing with himself somewhere, he realizes that he had drifted into some other area of the hive an area that he wanted to explore on a subsequent trip. And this is the thing, you have this terrifying experience and yet he wants to go back. Like he, he wants to go back because I tried an experiment that got me into trouble. It was this mid connection with one of the beings. And this is hilarious, right? So, there's, there's a lot of, um, it's like, I wonder if he'd already caught mind virus or something. Why do you say that? Because there's a lot of, uh, you know, what today we see with virtue signaling. Um, there's a lot of, like, self-hatred, uh, white white self-hatred in this. Really? Yeah, and there's a, uh, this kicks, kicks off this element of, like, of oddness and weirdness, right? So he says that going through these experiences and encountering these different beings, he says that he goes back into this space, and when he's back in this space, one of these beings comes up to him and it starts to merge with him. And he starts kind of like swapping something with this this, this being, right? That's him on the screen there. Right, okay. So as he's, he's melding with this being, uh, he says all of a sudden he gets this feeling that something's not good, like it's not right. And he says he pulled that vigorously. I'm like, I don't know what you were doing. Uh, and he says, not good, like uh, not good. And the, this link is severed. So he wakes up and he's back. But as he wakes up and he's back, so, oh my God, oh my God, this is so bad. And I'll read to you exactly what he says. It seems the thing I had ripped away from was angry or confused. There was a feeling of racism. The other that was connected to me had accused me of being racist. I walked around the house at this point with my brain mind divided still. I can only describe with this feeling of being left in parts and I didn't know what was going on. I felt extremely uncomfortable and disconnected in a seriously uh, distorting way. He said, I pleaded with the guard insulted to say I was sorry. So I'm like, oh God, that's cringe, man. How do, you, how do you get racism from like, merging with this being? Like, what are you talking about? Maybe the being didn't like humans and that's what he was picking up on. This is why it's cringe. 
because he goes back in. He goes back in to find the being and he and apologizes. It turns out the being is just simply a black dude and he goes <laughs> and he goes and this is what's really bad. Sorry. No. He goes to the Sorry guys for being racist. He goes to the guy You know how he knows he's a black guy? Because he goes, Oh, I go to his mind meld apartment or his apartment in the hive mind and he's playing funk music. Oh my gosh. <laughs> Was he also playing basketball? I, I know, I'm like, <laughs> okay, but you know, like, that's whatever, right? That's, but this is... Uh, it reminds me of that joke ball. article we saw the other day. It's it's not not true, it's like a satire article, but it's it's written by a black person complaining that they took um, um, DMT and all the machine elves were calling them the N-word. <laughs> oh my God. <laughs> that's a joke. It's a funny article though. They're like, has anyone else experienced this? I keep, I keep getting called the N-word whenever I go into another dimension. Oh, that's horrible. <laughs> but the thing about- it's a racist machine elf. But it's like, I'm like, mate, because it's just, it was just strange. Right? And I'm wondering if he's being, these experiences, though, this is where I'm, are, are they being colored by your perceptions? Like what, whatever issues you have, is that, and this comes up in the book a lot. It's like, look, this thing that fused with me was human and he lives here. And uh, the guy took me into his apartment and I could feel, not hear the music, it was funk music. I'm like, okay, all right, that's fine. But he said, I, this was enough evidence that these crab-faced beings were not predators, like the inorganic beings that were described by Castaneda in the, the Don Juan books. But he's like, is this all a trick? And this is good, like he's questioning, like, is this all a trick? But he's like, then the molecules are still hanging around and they're, they're homing in on me, they're following me. These appliances, these other objects are being presented to him. And you've got this from DMT experiences. People describe these objects being given to them. He says he's given some type of weird multicolored plasma orb and it changes him somehow. But I'm like, it's not said how it changes him. But he also points out that there are plasma flowers. He says, within this space, within this hive mind, there are these tiny glowing eyes on the ends of stalks where their bodies swirl, uh, they're multicolored. And uh, this is why I call them the plasma flowers. They would come out every time I entered a high dose trip. They were always mischievous. They would hover in the chamber of the hive and entice me to follow. He said, what about my body? This is something that he asked once. And they laughed at him. And he said it was like a group of bullies that were humoring him, but they were also making like they were leading him somewhere. They're intelligent, but there was something not quite right about it. Now, this is a disappointing part in the book because he says, I started to run into the agents. Yeah, I was going to ask you about this because uh, with a bit of searching, one of the first things that comes up is uh, someone asking if anyone's read his book and if anyone else has come across the police, these dream police. Well, that's kind of what he says. He says, um, basically, these soldiers are, are everywhere. And the most that I'll say, I'm, I'm quoting here, is that they're on familiar ground over here with where they are on the other side as well. Uh, and you don't want to get, they're basically there to stop things from getting out of hand. You don't want to interact with them. He says, the reason why I can't tell you is because to get out of a situation, I made a promise not to talk about them. So it's like, I'll what? mention them, but I'll never mention them again. So the idea is like some kind of men in black in another dimension. In his brain. Yeah, in another dimension. That's yeah, agents, he calls them. You're right, dream police. Yeah. And this is why people have been asking about this, because it's such an intriguing idea. And this is also something that we understand about these other realms, is that they have... They're police somehow. Hierarchies. Yeah. And it's, so, it's funny that you mentioned, like, his kind of woke ideology... Oh, it's um, worse. ...leeching in, but you go into these other dimensions and all that goes away, because... There is a hierarchy in other dimensions. There are walls, there are borders, there are more powerful beings. It's well, not also, all there's equal. no skin colour though, because it's not about it's not about, you know, these physical properties that we have. It's about it's like ultimately about your character and where you sit in this spiritual kind of realm. Right, well what I'm saying is there's some kind of order. Yeah, exactly, right? Um, but guess what? All of it, like this is the most unifying thing about this kind of stuff, is that all of all humans, regardless of, of whatever characters you have, we're the lowest of the low to these things. We're all the same. We're all the same. And these things, a lot of them don't like us. A lot of them claim to be raising our vibrations or improving us. It's just, it's not that, right? There's something not right. So let me describe some of the other experience he has. He uh, says that he ends up going into some of these places. He finds himself hovering over this place that looks like uh, this elaborate kind of dream landscape. And what he realizes is that it's every single dream that he's ever had. It's like the, it's like the, the loading room in the matrix, but for dreams. And it's all there in this particular space. It's like this living hologram. And it's not a memory, it's a place. It's still happening, it's alive, and it's all in his head all the time. And later on, he finds out that this is like a very low level, like this is a second plateau thing. So a lot of people 
come into this space, it's actually like the dream space that you go into. So when you dream, you enter into this kind of weird hologram and all these things happen while you're dreaming, but this drug just allows you to view it. It just allows you to access it a different way. Um, and he says, look, I saw the same kind of thing. Uh, he describes Daniel Pinchbeck who, uh, in his book, Opening or Breaking Open the Head, that he could see his thoughts arise and then vap- evaporate as particles of light while he was in an ayahuasca trance. He says, it's kind of the same thing that's going on here. And that's what the theosophists describe. Right, yeah. Annie Besant and Ledbetter describe seeing that. Well, he thoughts sa- emerging from people and then dissipating depending on the energy put into the thought. That's right. He says he sees these endless bits of floating living particles moving around that might be shards of these thoughts perhaps or memories or those sorts of things. He sees uh, these sophisticated leeches running along wires and streams of cable made leeches? of lights, Yeah, inside his head. Uh, but they're all strangely aware and they're looking back at me. But he says, I began to notice this shiny area that would appear on the wall of the hive. Something very important was about to be revealed to me. And it was. Like, he was eventually going to enter into this this new kind of space. Um, and it, it's it's fascinating because he says when he goes into this this new space, wherever it is, he's not entirely sure, it's made out of all this rock. Like it's like this rock-like material, but it's still rock generated by thoughts. And inside the rock, though, he says there's these two British guys. And these two British guys are like <laughs> this a is a digging, Python yeah, are digging through the rock. Like they're stuck in the rock and they're kind of digging through the rock. And as they're digging through the rock... How does he uh, know they're British? He talks to them. Yeah, like he gets all these impressions, right? And he starts getting these... And he realises, he's like, oh, it's my grandfather. Or one of my grandfather, both of my grandfather. Like, what? Yeah, and they're digging through. And it's all coming to him. And he's just like, but they're stuck. He's like, they're kind of stuck in this, this rock. And he starts to speculate as to what they're stuck in. It's like, is he... ancestral karma or something? Well, that's the thing, right? He's suggesting that this is some type of karmic wheel or something that they're they're stuck in, but it goes even further. He's just like, this is the result of um, essentially what their beliefs and their, like the, uh, I guess, how wonderful British society was, and now they're stuck in it. And then later on, like, wait for it. Let's do the next tick box. He's like... He describes another scene where he sees other people that are trapped and they were raised in a Christian household, so they're trapped by that. Oh. It's just like, it's like, where's the ticking the box, British right? society was great. <laughs> oh, look, it's really, it's really important to mention this because it, it comes full cringe towards the end. Um, so, but let's go back to what's going on because he said that I have a feeling that these places um, are similar to the places that were described by Rick Strassman. And he says there are these labs of some kind of alien beings with these vaulted areas inside with cartoonish or clown-like beings present. Um, he says these things in these neighbourhoods are somewhere inside this space that he's in. And he says, look, on the wall, like as soon as he's thinking this, he looks up and he says, on the wall is this moving figure. And he realizes that at first he thought it was a multicolored light. And he's like, oh, it's a DMT clown. Like it's the same, Uh-oh. Which you, the, the exact same clown that you see in DMT reports. Don't want to get on. Well, it, well, it doesn't say anything like that, but <laughs> who knows where we're going. Um, but once he enters into this new space and there's these appliances and these apartments, he says, these are like a, actual objects that are doing things and they're silver and they've got, some of them are transparent. Um, he says there's a whole heap of like tubes that are filled like going into underground laboratories and in a flash, he's suddenly inside. And as soon as he's flashed inside, this voice, this woman's voice says, you've reached the next level. And she's surprised, but like, she's actually surprised that he'd reached this next level. But he's like, see the way he treats it, it's like it's some type of, incredible achievement in a way he says look you know she was surprised not in a way that it was like um he was an idiot and couldn't do it it was more like oh i'm I'm just surprised that he persisted that long i'm like mate you just took a a bigger risk of taking a higher dose that's all you've done so is this considered the third plateau yeah that's kind of like it's not said but it kind of is like it's the third kind of plateau um but he says he feels like a foreigner inside this space and there's a couple of experiences so he saw like these these British men like digging through the rock and it doesn't really have any importance yet but it becomes very important later on um, but in the meantime you know he finds that as he's, he's moving through this space um, he's having thoughts and he notices this golden wall again like the golden wall has come back and with the golden wall he says he realizes what it is that substance around it's thought like that mm. taffy like substance yes yeah, okay but it's it's blank thought it's like pluripotent stem cells it's not anything yet it can turn into something it's potential thoughts it's potential thoughts but what it does as it transforms he says he watches and he describes these there's a lot of fluids in this book he describes these golden fluids like washing over things and falling down uh, he describes this incredible scene where he comes into this place and it's got this uh, emerald green kind of liquid in the center 
it's almost what you could consider to be our collective consciousness. Like, and it's all flowing over that rock that was described that the men were digging through and it's yeah. all flowing in. But that stuff can splash up. But later on, it starts forming over the walls of the golden wall. Oh, wow. You know what the golden wall is? The golden wall is memory. Oh, wow. It's memory. And they remember there's like little dots in the pits. It's almost like, he doesn't say binary, but I'm like, I'm wondering if that's what it is. It's like it stores memory because later on, the surface changes when the memory is imprinted upon it. And that's what's there. And he says he gets this because while he was still under the substance, but he was, um, you know, like reading a book at the same time, he said every word he read was imprinting itself on the wall as he's mm-hmm. as he's going through. The taffy is really interesting because we've heard this described from other psychic perceptions of thought being a material substance in another dimension. Yes. And when you... And it not being your own as well. Well, when you obsess over something, it can often... Uh, almost like it encases you it, it you feel trapped inside it and people with psychic perception have described it essentially covering your entire being you know if you're if you're ruminating on something you become obsessed with something it's not just that it's occupying your mind it's it's creating a field this taffy like substance as he's describing it yep. is actually starting to encase you you're yep. trapped inside it it. you can't people. see or think about anything else yeah yeah and these things they seem to um I shouldn't say feed on it, but they seem to love it. Like they love it when there's like um, uh, people are, are caught up in this stuff. This is like there's a curiosity there, but there's also, as I pointed out, a maliciousness as well on some level. So I mean, he's been taking this these high doses of DXM. He's had all these experiences. We get to the next chapter. He's like, well, I've been out all night out with an acquaintance, and I got talked into taking a few lines of cocaine. You know, something I'd have done for a few years, mate. What do you think is going to happen? Right, so he goes home. So what does he mix the he DMX? He I'll have some DXM to take the edge off. <laughs> okay. 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 He said DXM is an anesthetic, and so I thought that this might be able to calm me down. So it takes, you know, 800 grams, 1,000 grams, micrograms, sorry, milligrams, something like that. Uh, he picks up a book by Rupert Sheldrake and just starts reading. He just starts reading. Right. And as he's, you know, reading through, he says he finds that he's somewhere else once again in his mind but there's another he said there's an there's another like there's another being which he just refers to as other and he says something big is happening but I also have to pee like he's saying this to this entity <laughs> and the entity responds and he's like well look we'll try and show you this really quickly but you might want to hold on and he's like okay okay I'll hang on they take him into a lab they take him into a this lab. lab and he says it's in the well, hive machinery yeah he said the lights. detail is exquisite it was an elaborate detail. He says there's little blue machines, lights working on them. The little machines are like, hello, talking to him. And then like, see the work we have to do. And he's just like saying there's the machines, the machines, machines like the machines. And there's like rivers of molten glass that are clear as air. He says, this is living water. And the response is, yes, well, it's something like that. And he says he floats past workers that are working on some device that's made of silver fire. Um, but he's like, got no time to look. The other entity's like, no, 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 you don't have anything like that. You can't do that. You have to come. Come on, Marty, we have to go. So he um, I'm the pulse and he's like, do you see that down there? And he looks down and he says, there's like clay. It's like wood and, and wood and clay, right? But it's babies, he thought. He couldn't quite tell. But he said, are they the dead? And he's like, well, yeah, kind of technically. This is like where you see people form, right? They're forming from clay. I'm like, how many other experiences have we heard before of people that have had, you know, these near-death experiences saying they see this clay? Well, and it's this in the dirt. Bible. Yeah, right. So he's Man, seeing it's made some clay. So he's he's watching this. Um, and he says they're they're being, they're humans, they're unconscious, and they're being readied for their entry into this world, essentially. Um, and he says they're they're trying to put this information into these things and getting them all ready. And apparently there's like some valve that's clogged in him. So they're trying to work out communication. And he's like, uh, this other voice says, oh, would you like to speak to someone who's dead? And he says, oh, yeah, sure. So he's taken cocaine. <laughs> now he's taking DXM to take the edge off. And now he's speaking to the dead. Is he like, mind Führer? No. <laughs> no, 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 not quite. Uh, because, well, I shouldn't say that's terrible, actually. So during this experience, as he was writing this book, uh, that woman, Beth, who was the nurse who was assisting him uh, and, you know, getting looking after him while he was taking these drugs and, and recording his experiences, she died. Like, she died during this. Oh. And before She could have right? told me it was going to be some horrible thing before I made a dumb joke. Well, that's all right. It doesn't, we'll <laughs> forgive you for it, Ben. So he says, look, uh, where's Beth? And the other being says, looks around, it's like, oh, can we bring her up? 
and another different other steps in this other bee is like, oh yeah, sure, we'll get her. Now they look down and Beth is trapped in some corner. She's dazed, she's confused, right? And two figures come to pick her up and he says, my attention turns to two young black men. She's lucky, someone loves her and she's able to come here and we'll start all over again. <laughs> and that's it. What do what? I get? I, I kind of lost track of what you were describing there. So he sees She's scared and who, trapped. Who is this woman again? This so this is this is the woman that was looking after him when he was doing his experiences. She's dead. She's dead. She died after you know during these not but Walt and actually now in the afterlife there's two black men looking after. Yes. Him. All right. <laughs> so I'm like, I don't know why that, that even mattered, but that's that's what he brings up. Robert. Did he drop that in just to reaffirm that he's not racist? That's, that, yes, I think that's what happened, and that becomes abundantly apparent right at the end of the book. I'm like, it's not. It's not. It's just weird. I'm like, why are you doing this, right? So anyway, um, as he goes through, she sees him. Oh no, it's like he says, my cousin Lynn also died. You know, much much well before you know uh, this book, or during actually the writing the book. And so he's like, can I speak to Lynn? And Lynn comes through, and she's all excited, and you know, she starts hugging him, and she's like, oh, daddy, daddy, I love you so much. It's like this wonderful kind of reunion. And for him, it's like confirmation, but nothing really happens, right? He just, it's all in his mind or this space that he's having these experiences. But he says, then my turn comes and he sees these people that are being processed for whether or not they come back into this reality. Happening to Dan or to him? This, this is happening he says, to him. My turn comes and my being is cored. They blob me, which is where they hollow me out like a donut without a middle. Once this, I'm like, what, what's going on? He says, I understand it's an honor because they're removing something from him, like these ideas, I suppose, or thoughts. He says he's then taken to these endless blue apartments and laboratories full of organic plasma machines. And uh, he's shown these, he's given a tour through them. And as he's given a tour through all this stuff, it's like he's been fixed. And he's, and he's allowed to leave. Yeah, they blobbed him, obviously. And the last thing that the beings say to him as he passes through this gate is don't do cocaine anymore, goodbye. <laughs> then he says thank you when he wakes up in his bed. <laughs> Freshly blobbed. Freshly and, blobbed. And caught out. I'm just like, this is not sounding good. He said, I went to the porch and threw the coke into the wooded lot next door. <laughs> Okay. But he does point out that he can see the hive, like he looks up and the, the entirety of the hive he can now see. So it's kind of giving this impression that it's not just inside his mind, it's 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 somewhere else, right? It's another space. Um, but he says, look, I estimate that I've spent about 100 hours in the hive, in this invisible landscape. I've seen the appliances, the rooms, the spaces. Uh, and he points out, he's like, well, there are actually plateaus, like, but it's rooms, it's like room one, and room one contains these plastic shape-shifting kind of things. And it's You're about an hour in. Is this building up to any oh, conclusion yeah. with this guy? Okay, so, all right, well, it, it becomes ridiculous. So what we'll do is uh, he answers the machine elves. So I'll, I'll uh, you know what? What do you mean he answers the machine? So, you know, you know Terrence you McKenna. Time. I'm just okay. saying you're, you're out of right. 55 minutes. So, Terrence McKenna described mach seeing machine elves, yeah. right? This is something that, you know, um, and many people taking DMT have described. They see these, um, I guess you could call them like cybernetic organisms that are doing certain functions and moving around uh, in a very shortened kind of fashion. He claims that he sees these things as well. Uh, and when he sees them, he'd actually drawn a picture while it was happening. And he pardon me, he produces the picture and he says the picture looks like these entities with a series of plastic tubes linked together and it's coming out and it's kind of twisting and spiralling and he says, he gives it to Beth and this is before, this is the woman that he'd spoke with while she was alive mm. and immediately she's like, that that looks like DNA but at the molecular level and he's like, oh, okay and he goes and checks it out and it turns out that it is it, like it actually matches like the molecular structure of DNA and he says, it reminded me of a book that was written by anthropologist um, Jeremy Narby. It's called The Cosmic Serpent. And in the Classic. Yeah, in The Cosmic right, Serpent, right. he describes how DNA works and how essentially, though, um, DNA forms machines, which are, are proteins. These are you know, self-folding proteins. And he's like, this is what the machine elves are. And he realizes what's inside his head. The machine elves are the products of DNA. Right. It's like, or they are DNA. That's right. precisely what they are. And he says, they wait for you. They offer these Fabergé eggs. And in another book that I was actually going through today, where there was another experience, which I don't have the book in front of me, but I will link to it in the show notes. There was another guy who was describing these, these Fabergé eggs as well, which is something many people having this experience have said. But these Fabergé eggs are actually like concoctions of emotions and uh, feelings and thoughts and everything else. And they give them to you. 
And he says, it's like a ribosome. It's like a transfer of, of messenger RNA. He says, these things are molecular computers inside our bodies and I can see it inside my mind. And he thinks that's what people are seeing when they have these machine elves experience. They're actually still going inside their space, like inside their own space, and they're seeing the actual workings of their body down at the submolecular yeah, level. Yeah, it really shows the vastness of the, the endless microcosm yep. inside the human body. And that was often the uh, spoken of in the Eastern religions, is that the, inside the, human, the vastness of the human body is similar to a universe. It yes, is a universe. Absolutely. And he says, look, you know, I, this what's occurring here is like I have seen the inner workings of our body but they're alive they're parts but they're aware they're looking back at me and this is all happening on the molecular level of the brain this was no illusion it was no hallucination it wasn't blurry it was all very clear and my state fits with what other people have reported when taking DMT it was perfectly in focus and I was there uh, he said I would sit there and I would watch this for 45 minutes at a time um, yeah there's also depiction Hiya, yeah, I'm fine, thanks. You want to pick up? We do, love you, please. Okie dokie, it'll be in about an hour or so. That's fine, see you later. All right, see you in a bit, ta-da. Okay, thank you, bye. Nice pieces of each other and swap, which is also, you know, similar to what mm -hmm. DNA would do or, you know, that kind of thing. But then later on, he says, look, I, I encountered the Sprite. And for him, this is why he thinks this is very much real. Is he says, look, I took four months a four month break from tripping. And he says, this is always a good idea because the brain can certainly use it. Uh, he points out that in one of the experiences when one of these others had been there, that it actually had shown him brain damage. They're taking him up to a wall, up to this part of the hive and was like, this is all damaged, like look at it. And it was kind of, it's like, maybe it's from the DXM, like that's actually warning me about it. <laughs> um, but he said, he takes his time off. But he says, then, you know, after having all this time off, he takes like 1500 milligrams. Like just, nice. And because he's had so long off it, he's, oh, sorry, a thousand, no, no, it's 1500 milligrams. Um, it's too much because his tolerance is gone. That's what they say in the DEA document yep. that some people take up to 1500 milligrams. He takes it and he's like, oh, I don't have any benzodiazepines to take the edge off. So I take opiates as well. So he takes opiates and he says that was dumb because it causes him to become all like paralyzed up. And he says, I come into a tunnel and this tunnel is like a foot from my face and there's some type of device that's just kind of poking through, plasma binoculars if you will. <laughs> he says, for a time, I'm allowed to look at this city and he says it's this vast region of electricity of great crystals towering over seas of light and this uh, liquid effervescent light is dripping from these things and these rivers and it's all very, it sounds unusual now, but I could see all of it. Um, but he says all of a sudden the room kind of dissolves and these board like panels all come around him and then suddenly like a, a hologram change and it becomes a forest. It becomes into this forest space. And in the forest space, he says a witch emerges from it. And she was laughing and zeroing in on me. And he's like, this is weird. And she's la and as she's laughing, he thinks she's there to get a kick out of the situation. And as soon as he thinks this, this entity, this witch, he says, come on, Sprite! And this Sprite, this elf-like creature, a foot tall, gray, jumps out of the forest, hugs onto his lower right leg, and starts dry humping his left. <laughs> like, oh, you are rare among humans, born of the moon. The trees sent their regards. And he's like, I got basically humped by a tree elf. Was it like, eh, eh, yeah, eh, this eh. thing, right, is, is doing this to him. Uh, and then at the same That's time, fantastic like, finish like, like story. poking the back of his head and poking the back and saying, this is where you come through. And that's like, he points out later on, this is where the, like the, the 12 point where the human awareness enters the embryo in the womb. Uh, and he says, but why it's all real for him is because later on he goes to a bookstore and he finds this book that has the term Sprite. And he's like, I hadn't heard the term Sprite before. So for him, it was like this other synchronicity that kind of occurred and, you know, it all became, you know, quite incredible for him. But look, I won't put it into plus. I'll just tell you the end. Like, I'll just, I'll just give you the end. Well, so, it reminds me of this book. Remember very this? similar. From, what, six years ago or something? This is Great Vera book. Stanley Adler from The Mundane to The Magnificent. She was a theosophist, but she told this story. It's a really her autobiography where she was approached, she claimed, by some kind of uh, ascended master. I think it was... It, it was Raphael, Arch oh, Archangel yeah, yeah, Raphael. Like that, yeah. And he shrinks her down. Like, and she can see the cells. And she goes inside her own body. And it's 
similar to what you're describing without the psychedelic sheen to it because she's fully in her conscious you know she has a conscious acumen with her that's right she has perhaps a better discernment of what's going on and it's fascinating because she has conversations with like some king that's in charge of her kidney and that's right <laughs> it goes all, right down into the cells and it's all incredibly similar like incredibly similar to what this guy's doing but I mean he's doing it from you know util- utilizing drugs but yeah it, it's it's very similar but then of course it's all every time it's every, every single, single time, time. We get to the Native Americans. Oh, <laughs> I thought you were talking about so, someone else. <laughs> no, he, he finds out that um, these beings, right, are forming walls around him to protect him, he claims, right? Turns out they're Native American guardians. He has no American, Native American ancestry, oh, from what I understand. Let me guess, he's got Native American Maybe guardian spirits. He's got Native American they're, guardians. They're his spirit guides. Every time in these these cliche sorts of experiences, yes. you get I'm, this. I'm Australian and I think I've got Native American My spirit guides. My kids are Native American descent. They are. And they've got Native American spirit but guides. They, oh, I don't know. I've never checked with them. You could go into the arse end of Africa and you could find <laughs> just some guy selling uh, wooden wheels on the side of the street. And his spirit guides would be Native Americans. Gets even better, right? So these, basically, remember the two British guys I told you that were digging around in the own horror that they've created? He's like, well, no one really knows just how bad the British were. Like, they wanted to have really bad things. So that's why they're trapped inside. It's like this ancestral thing. And they're trapped inside there. And as he's talking to his American Indian guide, um, the guide's like, oh, well, we know that you're not them. We know that you've right. right. Like, you're not them. And I'm just like, oh, no. You're one of the good white people. Not only not that, the right? evil ones. He says when he comes out of it, he somehow meets, he goes out, right? And another synchronicity happens because he's on a hike and there's a sign while he's on a hike and the sign is powwow, one mile. So he wanders into some random festival somewhere, a Native American festival. And when he's there, he says he meets a Native American and they invite him to some, um, what was another powwow. He says, we're invited to a powwow and we are the only whites there. <laughs> Like this is what's happened. Like usually, that's a sign you should leave. So uh, the kicker to the story is right. The kicker to the story. After all this, like, <laughs> he doesn't really have any insight. He doesn't really. It doesn't appear to gain anything. And in fact, um, you know, he starts demonstrating that, like DXM. Yeah, he has. What he's got from this is he has been able to. I think he has entered some realm. He has gone somewhere. He has recorded, he has experienced it, but ultimately like this, he hasn't brought back any real knowledge. He hasn't brought back any real wisdom. And the cost of this is, he actually died two years before this book was published. He killed himself. Suicide, right? Yeah. He killed himself. And guess what DXM does? DXM acts on the Sigma-1 receptors, which mediates depression. Whoops. So this drug may very well have ultimately killed him. Indirectly, of course, but... And and then I'm like, well, these entities you're dealing with, like, did the entities direct this? It's like... It's just a, um, it's a fascinating experience to see this, like someone entering into this space. But it also once again confirms just how dangerous it is to enter into this realm. And a really good example is, and, and this is why I always go back to this thing of like, I truly believe that we can enter these interdimensional realms. But the real way to do it is through hard work. Like really, like it's got to be hard. You can't just take a drug or a substance and expect to get this instantaneous result. Because we know that with everything else in the world, that it's not easy, mm. right? It's not easy. It's like you're hard. If you want something good, you've got to put effort in. So you have these monks, you know, monks, for example, that go on these really, really you know, tight diet, restrictive diets. Um, they follow very restrictive routines and regimes, and they do it for years and years and years on it. And even then, they don't achieve enlightenment. Like he's kind of banding around the term enlightenment. Like he's already got it because he's sat there and taken some cough syrup. Um, but he describes this scene where. He takes the drugs and he ends up in this space and he finds these walls and they've got like Tibetan mandalas kind of yep. all over it. And he finds a bunch of monks. And these monks, it's not even like it's in his mind. It's like he enters into a space where these enlightened monks are hanging out. And the monks come along and they put him on this chair, right? And he sits on this chair and they're all like clapping and he's excited and he's like, oh my God, like I've reached this level of the monks. The chair collapses from underneath him and all the monks mock him. And it's like, I wonder if that's almost like they've found something, like they're in this space that they've worked hard for, and he's come along just taking, they're just laughing at him. He's an imposter. He's an imposter. And they were trying to like bring him up, and then there's, it's like he's being tested by this chair perhaps, I don't know, but it's like it collapses from underneath him, and they just all laugh, and they all mock. 
And it's just the difference. And obviously, you know, you see the results of, of what happens. Well, the, the difference that I always harp on is when you're talking about a monk, whether it's from the East or the West, they're following a particular practice that leads them to God. And included in that practice, whether it's Christianity or Buddhism or whatever it is, there are moral principles that must be adhered to. And none of that is cultivating your heart. Yeah. You're cultivating the, the moral fiber of your character. And when you take drugs, you're not doing that. No. You're just taking drugs. I mean, look, if you want to take these substances to, you know, explore these realms and, and have fun, I, I get it. I do get that. But the idea that it can bring you enlightenment, the idea that it can, like, he even talks about, um, like, seeing the face of God. Like, he's brought to the face of God, and the face of God is a mask. And that's kind of all he, all he says about it. And I'm just like, I, I don't think you can achieve that through using drugs. Like, I just don't think that's the, the way to get you there. So, ultimately, it's it's a really fascinating story in his experiences, but there's just nothing of, of significant substance that comes out of these experiences. Well, in, in the end, it destroyed him. It destroyed him. You would have to assume if he committed suicide right before the book was published. Yeah. And this was, you know, we just heard about everything he went through. We got to wonder what happened. Drove him to the edge, yeah. clearly. Yeah, exactly. It must have been what happened. So yeah, I'll link to the book in the show notes at mysteriousuniverse.org. It's available on Kindle uh, right now. But uh, you look, it's still full of, there's a whole heap of other fascinating experiences that he goes through in that book. Coming up in Plus, aliens oh, are with us. Bill Roundtree, what I learned from aliens visiting me over 100 times, spanning 50 years. And there's a weird woman in the background with a camera. Is it a camera? Are there, are there so I, I don't even want to speculate. What is going Is this some kind of voyeuristic, hot, blonde, <laughs> Pleiadian woman <laughs> that shows up in his bedroom at night and just takes photos of him? Paints him like some French whore? I'm is that yes. what's coming if up? If it's coming up plus, plus I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to say yes. We, we also have a backup segment in <laughs> case this one bombs. Oh, what was that? Is that well... A little bit of a spoiler coming up. Right. A little bit of a spoiler. Uh, we also may have this classic. Oh, you're obsessed with that. <laughs> <laughs> Apache Portal by Carl Grimsman. And uh, we may go... Is that Dan there? We may go into the, the little one-foot-tall T-1000 gnome terminator great heaps of stuff coming up in plus head to mysteriousuniverse.org forward slash plus for all the details sign up today get access to the big extensions we do on these shows every single friday and of course if you sign up you get an exclusive show that comes out on tuesday you're getting more than double the content if you sign up for plus uh, you also get a higher quality mp3 feed if you want to listen to the audio